Man, things are heating up here in Southern California, and I'm not talking about the heat wave. I'm talking about all the discussions regarding what's been coming out of E3, whether it be gaming, consoles, or of course PC hardware, because AMD has obviously stolen the show with the amount of uh, news and, and press releases and all that sort of stuff. Now, yes, I'm aware that this is right on the heels of the last video we did about Radeon, but I think there's a lot more to talk about. We have more insight, we've done more research, and we got to have a uh, finally have a meeting with AMD engineers and talk to them specifically about some of our questions and concerns, which I've seen parroted in the in the comment section of a lot of the videos. So we asked them this, a lot of those hard facts, or hard facts, no hard questions that we got some information on, and then also kind of a new perspective of how to sort of look at the 5700 XT and the 5700. So let's go ahead and talk about that. With their nine blade design, the Skiron DRGB fans from Metallic Gear offer a balance of performance and aesthetics. Available in both 120 and 140 millimeter sizes, the Skiron fans are sure to fit any size builds. Hub mounted LEDs provide a wide spread of lighting while the daisy chainable wiring harness ensure a tidy wiring job every time. To learn more about the Skiron RGB and DRGB fans from Metallic Gear, click the link in the description below. All right, so let's rewind to August of 2018. Specifically, uh, Cologne, Germany, when NVIDIA launched their RTX lineup of graphics cards. And by lineup, I mean 2080 and 2080 Ti with a 2070 kind of thrown in the mix there a little bit. And there, here was the response. And, and this is a totally justified response, but this was the general response from the public. They cost how much? You're getting 20 to 30% more performance over Pascal 1080 Ti but you're getting, it's costing you 40% more, or whatever it was, 50% more, something crazy like that. The, the general consensus was gamers want performance. They want high FPS, low latency, low response times, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. So turning on a fidelity feature like ray tracing at the cost of 50% or more FPS at the time anyway. There's been some optimizations, but still, it's a, it's a performance tax no matter what. The audience said, we don't care about DXR, we care about performance. Well, let's fast forward nine months later now to June of 2019 at E3. AMD launches its new uh, high-end gaming cards, not to be confused with the enthusiast level, which is where the Vega stuff and like RTX kind of resides but a high-end 5700 XT and a slightly lesser high-end 5700 uh, featuring 70 nanometer Navi technology on the new RDNA architecture, completely different from GCN, uh, which stands for um, Graphics Core Next, if you didn't know. The most common thing we saw, even though it was on average $100 less than its direct competitor from NVIDIA and giving you anywhere from two to 21% more performance in gaming, was where's the RTX or where's the DXR? Where's the ray tracing? Navi was our savior. Why don't we have ray tracing? Navi, you were supposed to save us. So I find it kind of interesting that the audience back, uh, not even a year ago was, and it, even just last week when we did our video about uh, the Quake 2 RTX update was, no one cares about this crap. But then there's so many people out there that are like, what the hell, why doesn't it have DXR? So we're in this weird kind of a limbo space where you have to make this decision do you want max performance or do you want max fidelity? And by fidelity, I mean all the eye candy, right? Uh, the global illumination, um, soft shadows, the, uh, obviously uh, DXR ray tracing for light path, all that sort of stuff. You have to kind of take your pick because right now we are on the cusp of the next gaming revolution. Just like we were nearly 20 years ago when rasterization came out, we are, we are on the next generation of the way games are going to be performed. So I asked this question specifically when we had our meeting today with AMD, I said, can you speak to why DXR is not something that was mentioned outside of the console space? Because that's the other thing that confused a lot of people was like, well, wait a minute. If Project uh, whatever it's called for the new Xbox, Scarlet, if it's going to have 8K capable gaming and it's gonna have ray tracing, and it's an AMD GPU, or APU technically, why the heck is the PC space not even mentioning it or talking about it when that's AMD's bread and butter? So I asked them that very same question. And it, it, the general consensus here, and of course this was a lot of like, not off the record, but this is off the slides 
at this point because there was this was not a specific forethought conversation that was supposed to be had was that ray tracing does indeed need some um, maturity and not with the architecture which obviously needs to happen I mean, NVIDIA is doing it through uh, tensor cores for DLSS, and that's a super sampling, right? Deep learning super sampling. And then it needs to be also optimized in the RT core space, which is what's happening with all the ray tracing calculations. All that math is being performed on the RT cores, and then the CUDA cores handle a lot of the other post processing and, and all that sort of stuff. So we've seen a good first gen implementation of it in terms of the fact that you can even do it in real time was already kind of the, 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 the wow factor. And then doing it at 60 FPS is already great, obviously at a huge cost of $1,200. So $1,200 for 60 FPS, regardless of how good the scene looks, seemed like a huge step backwards to gamers, and then the outcry was obvious. So AMD made the conscious choice of targeting where most gamers reside, and that is going to be in the, well, the 5700 XT and 5700 are indeed high-end cards, but it's going to be in that range and down. To be fair, I think most gamers are shopping around $250. And if you want to spend that kind of money on a graphics card, you're still going to be stuck with like the RX 580, RX 480, or well, no, not the 480, 580, 570, or even a 590. But you're not going to obviously be getting any of the new RD, RDNA tech, uh, architecture. The best way to kind of look at this is the way Ryzen first gen, like the 1000 series, wasn't so much a game changer as much as it was a disruptor. It's referred to as a disruptor because it was designed to just kind of make people kind of go, whoa, wait a minute, what just happened? Okay, I'm not sure about this. Something happened, I want to see how this plays out. And then uh, 2000 series Ryzen, which is still first gen Ryzen, came out and the market share started to shift. Intel's market share gains stalled and then AMD gained back CPU market share, although Intel was still the dominant player. AMD gained back market share and then Zen 2 now giving us the amount of increase we saw in IPC and now beating apparently core for core Intel CPUs at a much lesser price has changed the CPU industry. This is what AMD is banking on our DNA being for graphics. This is first gen Ryzen for graphics cards. You're not gonna see the disruption necessarily happening right now, but what you're gonna probably see is a lot of people adopt that whole wait and see attitude and as long as AMD can live up to the promises of we are going to be making this as good as possible over the next several generations, and by generations I don't mean we're talking five-year plan, I mean we're talking three-year plan probably at this point, then what you'll start to see is a much broader spectrum of competition taking place across the board. But like anything else, you can't get there without launching the initial disruptor in the first place. The other thing that they, the reason why they didn't launch this high-end, God-saving, sa you know, save the gamers Navi architecture, which everyone thought was gonna be coming out. Because don't remember a year ago, we heard that there was gonna be a RTX killing card for $250 from AMD, and that's called Navi. Well, the internet sort of made that up on their own. AMD, you cannot find a single piece of information where AMD even speculated or hinted at any sort of performance for that, perform or that dollar range whatsoever. But what AMD has decided is that the raw performance is more important than the eye candy. But at the same time, what they found was more important was that you have backwards compatibility in terms of the toolkits. And because GCN is so matured in terms of being in the console space, in the PC space, in the cloud space, as well as mobile, it was, it's easier to implement and get the technology out into the wild by making sure that it's backwards compatible with all of that while featuring forward compatible technologies as developers come online for it. So they adopted what a lot of people said NVIDIA should have done, which is the adopt now and then we promise in six months to a year these features will become available because of the fact that, you know, it's gonna take time for RTX and, and DXR to be implemented by the developers. They decided to build a graphics card on a new architecture because as much as people want to say RDNA is just a rebranded GCN, it's not. It is ground up different. The difference is that it's ground up different with 100% backwards support or backwards compatibility support. So that allows you to have a much broader spectrum of adoption of this particular card in terms of games being designed for it, while also utilizing forward-facing technologies that are only gonna be available on the Navi-based architecture 
that once the adoption rate improves and more Navi cards are out in the wild, then you're gonna see features come online later on in games, whether they're new games or updates to existing games. That means your graphics card that you buy today will get even more value in the future. Features that people care about, like uh, Radeon image sharpening, which is gonna be sort of like a DLSS, but it's open source and anyone can use it, including NVIDIA if they want to. It's kind of like the opposite of how Hairworks and, and the um, NVIDIA um, Gameworks was back in the past, although that was a very closed source and developers had to either buy packages or buy particular you know, SDKs and stuff to use those features. It is 100% um, open. You're also gonna have uh, Fidelity FX, which is gonna be different features that uh, people can, uh, or developers can put into their games that are gonna be optimized on obviously Navi architecture. So forward compatible stuff or forward technically future proofing that as those features come online, the architecture that was designed with those features in mind are gonna be remain much more relevant into the future rather than suddenly going, well, I've gotta buy a new graphics card now to use all these features. You buy a new graphics card now that gets you an immediate performance bump in the way games are played today on the APIs and the SDKs that are available today specifically being, you know, obviously DirectX and Vulkan. And then we're gonna see an improvement in the future. So that is sort of the strategy behind why AMD launched at the 5700 XT and 5700. Now we tried really hard, trust me. We tried to find out if there was gonna be an RX uh, 5800 XT or a 5600, because I feel like two SKUs on the RDNA family, that's a good place to start. I'd be shocked if we didn't see uh, uh, the, the stack sort of trickled down a little bit, but I don't think you guys, if you guys are waiting for a 2080 Ti competitor from Navi, I don't think you're gonna see it in this family. I would love, trust me, to see a 2080 Ti rival right now from AMD, but it's clear that the Radeon 7 is the enthusiast card that you get from AMD right now. For more entry level stuff, I almost feel like we're probably not gonna see anything until a little bit later on, maybe when the new, um, the updated Zen APUs come out featuring Navi. I also asked that question, I was like, can we, we see the 3200 and 3400G featuring Ray, uh, Vega 8, will we potentially see those uh, utilizing uh, Navi in the future? And of course it was, uh, well, we're talking about this today, we can't talk about anything in the future. And of course, I knew that was gonna be the answer, but I've gotta try, right? I've gotta ask the questions that you guys were all wondering. The whole point of this video, and in fact, if anyone even said, just skip this video and go to this time point, stamp this one. If you are waiting for an NVIDIA killing AMD ray tracing card, this is not it. It's not coming. And you should probably just go ahead and determine which purchase makes sense for you right now, whether you want a $100 more expensive NVIDIA card that can do ray tracing, or a $100 lesser expensive graphics card from AMD, that gives you more raw performance than the $100 car, a card that costs more, or you get your DXR and then the frame rates kind of do that because you know DXR is a huge impact of performance, but you have that choice and the choice is yours and as a consumer, that's where you vote. Not the comment section, not the like dislike ratio. You spend your money on what you believe in, that's how you vote. All right guys, thanks for watching. I just wanted to sort of add to our last video because now that we've got a little bit more insight and got to get face to face and ask questions that were way off the slide, um, I felt like an extension to our previous video was necessary. All right guys, thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one. And the next one's gonna include some hands-on stuff with Ryzen, which I cannot wait for, because teaser, we might be going back to Ryzen for long-term testing with our editing rigs because of new graphics AP, or graphics uh, SDKs that are integrate, they're gonna integrate with Adobe and stuff if and when Adobe ever gets off their ass to implement it. <laughs> All right guys. It's an exciting time to be a PC gamer. As always, we'll see you in the next one.